Namaste. I'm Hemashri Madhabushi, and I'm presenting the story of Ajamila, Poshana in the Age of Kali. In modernity, wealth, pleasure, and the perpetual striving for acquisition are valued over traditional ethics or dharma. Dharma Samvada, as illustrated by Ajamila's story, allows us to negotiate between modern and traditional discussions on dharma. Ajamila, a fallen Brahmana, is miraculously saved by Mahavishnu's attendants from death's messengers when he accidentally calls to his son Narayana. This story presents seemingly irresolvable perspectives. Does it invalidate karma by overriding Ajamila's adharma? Or does it eulogize the emancipatory potential of Bhagavan's name? Significantly, the name Narayana also belongs to Brahman, and it thus saved Ajamila and bestowed eternal happiness on him. The Hindu tradition, beginning with the invocatory power of Vedic mantras and the Itihasa Purana praxis of Japa, eulogizes the potency of the name. The Ajamala story demonstrates how Dharma Samshaya effectively keeps the discussion of ethics an open field. To resolve the contradiction would make Dharma Samvada dogmatic. Thus, Dharma is rendered relevant to every society, modern or traditional. Cogitated thus, I demonstrate that despite the determinism of karma, the presence of grace, anugraha, or poshana can be negotiated through surrendering karma phala to Ishvara. The Ajamala episode continues the conversation between Parikshit and Shuka, where Parikshit wants to know how to escape suffering in Naraka as a result of his karma, while inextricably bound to this samsaric cycle resulting from his karma and karma phala. It is here that Shuka relates the story of Ajamala of Kanyakubja to illustrate the power and saving grace of devotion. The Brahmana Ajamila was a pious and virtuous man who lived by the strictures and scriptural constraints appropriate to his Varnashrama. While gathering material needed for his daily prayers in the woods one day, he is distracted by the wanton behavior of a man and his harlot. Yielding to temptation, he leaves behind his wife, parents, and his duties, thus shunning his Varnashrama dharma. Preoccupied with his concubine and his youngest favorite child named Narayana many years pass. One day, surprised by the sudden approach of Yama's emissaries at his appointed time of death, he cries out his son Narayana's name in terror, which immediately attracts the emissaries of Mahavishnu. They halt Yama's deputies, who had already begun extracting Ajamela's soul. When Yama's deputies questioned the authority of Mahavishnu's attendants in obstructing the orders of Yamadharma Raja, god of justice, there ensues a dharma samvada between these two sets of attendants. Yama's deputies respond to questions from Mahavishnu's attendants and describe the essence of dharma, pointing to the theory of karma that dictates that the results of any action are reaped by the person who commits it, provided that person is attached to its fruits. Yama decides on the appropriate purgatory in proportion to a man's dharma or adharma, as well as the nature of his future births. This endless cycle of samsara can only be broken through the jiva's devotion to the Supreme Lord. Yama himself declares that devotion to the great Mahavishnu is a protective shield against all sorts of calamities, including death. The presence of faith and devotion together engenders deep-rooted devotion or prema bhakti in a seeker, which is an even higher goal than mukti. Devotees who follow the path of bhakti are no longer within Yama's purview since they are now under the protection of the infinite being and their sins can be dispelled by merely uttering the Lord's name. Chanting Sri Hari's name with faith and devotion is the only true path to the expiation of all sins whereby a man is never again tempted by worldly ambitions or to commit fresh sins. Once a soul has attained identity with Narayana, no karmas can attach to it, since Narayana is beyond guna and karma. Yama's attendants can therefore no longer reap that soul which now ceases transmigration and achieves liberation from the cycle of samsara. The Bhagavatam repeatedly stresses the pitfalls associated with attachment to fruits of karma and instead points us to the superiority of mukti and bhakti. The subtleties of karmakanda are detailed in many Hindu texts as explored here. The Manusmriti, for instance, clarifies the difference between actions that maintain our mundane existence, pravritti, and those that transcend the mundane, nivritti, which allows us to pass beyond the reach of the five elements, 
thus establishing a framework with which to view karma and karmaphala. The Ishavasya Upanishad also highlights the necessity to engage in both karma and gaining vidya according to Shankara. Shukar concludes by saying that the path of devotion is best suited for most men. This is echoed by the emphasis on single-pointed devotion to Narayana in Bhishma's discourse to Yudhishthira in the Narayaniya in the Mahabharata's Shanti Parvan. Narayana himself eulogizes Ekantins or those who worship him with single-pointed devotion, just as Shukar advocates devotion to Lord Krishna in the Ajamila story. The same prominence is given to devotion in the Bhagavad Gita chapter 12 on Bhakti Yoga, where Sri Krishna elevates those who worship his personal form to the highest rank, thus emphasizing the primacy of the path of devotion. The Brihadaranyaka Upanishad describes the kinds of karmas that lead to the attainment of the three lokas of man, manushya, the ancestors, pitras, and the gods, devas. The world of the gods is the best of the three worlds, with meditation being the only means of attaining it. Ajamila, firmly ensconced in the world of men, pursuing only his pravriti dharma, was lifted out of that world through meditation on the Lord's name, even if it was accidental. It powerfully illustrates the Lord's portion or divine grace by which even the undeserving are saved. The transcendent teaching that stories such as that of the dissolute Ajamila of Gajendra Moksha or Shishupala aim to highlight is Bhagavata Dharma, the power inherent in chanting the name of the divine ideally with faith and devotion. Ajamila is undoubtedly a sinner without intentional faith. The question of why he was saved for merely taking the Lord's name once is unsurprisingly a subject of much discussion and controversy. Viewed from the perspective of Dharma Samvada, an important aspect of Hindu ethics, how can we reconcile Ajamila's pursuit of illicit pleasures with his eventual deliverance from sure purgatory? The only answer to this apparent dissonance is the acceptance of Bhagavata Dharma, which elevates the intrinsic power and holiness of chanting the name of the Supreme Being to the apex of human aspiration and action. It follows that by his divine grace, the jiva is saved. The timeless answer to why only some people are saved rests on the inscrutability of grace, of anugraha, which is causeless and unpredictable and is according to the will of the Supreme Being. Ajamila was saved either due to good deeds and previous births which invited divine grace that is not and cannot be measured in human terms. While it is not possible to escape the fruits of sinful actions, to paraphrase Sridhar Swami, sinful tendencies in man can only be eliminated by sustained and consistent devotional practice. Adding even more complexity to the debate is that his uttering of Bhagavan's name when faced with death was entirely accidental. Ajamila was still bound by Pravriti Dharma when he called out to his son Narayana, at least superficially. What saved him? was that his name also belonged to Bhagavan. In response to this doubt, Dharma Samshaya, we turn once again to the Bhagavad Gita, which grants emancipatory potential to a seeker who meditates exclusively on Bhagavan in his last moments, shown in Gita 8.5. Gita 9.30 eulogizes the potency of the name, bolstering the argument that chronic sinners, such as the Adharmic Ajamila, can seek refuge in the Lord and transcend the results of their wrongful actions. The philosophical underpinnings of the allegorical Ajamila narrative are impossible to ignore. In Parikshit's final days, Shukar's discourse on Lord Krishna is a constant reminder to meditate on the Supreme Lord and invite his divine grace through redemption and protection. Extending this allegory further, in this Kali Yuga, where Dharma is standing on one leg and Dharma itself is adrift, Reading and listening to the Bhagavatam serves as the rudder that can steer us towards the Supreme, purify us and assure deliverance through his divine grace. It reminds us that despite the inescapable cycle of karma, anugraha can be negotiated if we surrender karma phala to Ishvara and invoke his protection through faith and devotion. It remains our ultimate hope in these times when chaos and pursuit of rampant materialistic goals reigns. In striking contrast to the vivid descriptions of the horrors awaiting sinners in the various purgatories or naraka in the preceding skanda 5, it provides a powerful message of solace, solace that can be found in bhakti to the Supreme Lord. 
there is an additional dimension at stake here. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna declares that of the four types of devotees, the jnani is the best. The Bhagavata Purana, for its part, does not merely espouse bhakti and set aside jnana. Rather, it provides the best interpretation of Upanishadic Brahman and thus a continuation of the jnana kanda portion of the Vedic revelation. What then is the relation of nama to jnana? For commentators, beginning with Sri Swami, the Vaidika Dharma issue has already been settled, but the debate over jnana versus bhakti is still alive and bhakti is praised as superior for achieving moksha. Knowledge destroys karma, but so does the name of Narayana. Although it was written at a very different time and place, the Bhagavatam manages to prod the reader to grapple with the ethical dilemma posed by Ajamila's adharmic actions, which are overridden by invoking the divine name. The Dharma Samvada that it presents remains as applicable today as we attempt to negotiate between modern and traditional debates on Dharma. In this age of Kali, are we not all prey to the temptations of Artha and Kama that are too great to resist? Are we not, by our daily karma, effectively shunning our Varnashrama Dharma? On the other hand, is it not unrealistic to expect that we can live by ancient Vedic injunctions in these times? Presumably, the answer to all these questions is a resounding yes. But the Bhagavatam shows us there is no need for despair. While this debate is seemingly irresolvable, it resists the label of dogma by its very incertitude. It renders dharma relevant to every society. Although the Bhagavatam prefers to highlight the unqualified greatness of the name, it can also be viewed as artavada, a eulogy to the name, or an exaggeration to nudge people to the devotional path. It plants the seed of the idea in the mind of the reader that if someone even as depraved as Ajamila could be saved by chanting the divine name, reciting it with faith and devotion would greatly increase its efficacy. What is unquestionable though, is that one may not engage in Nama Vyaharanam with hypocrisy. Since Ajamila did not chant Narayana's name deliberately with the hope that it would absolve him of the fruits of his sinful actions, his actions stem from Avidya. The Bhagavatam is categorically opposed to uttering the divine name as an easy route to expiation of a lifetime of deliberate misconduct. Nama Paradha, or fecklessly taking his name, is considered highly sinful and an egregious offense to the divine name. Invoking the power of the name of the Lord provides no loophole for Adharma. Om Namo Narayanaya.